Hi, I'm Mark Coniglio, creator of Isadora. This is tutorial 11, part two. We're picking up where we left off with tutorial 11, uh, which is an introduction of how to use MIDI as a triggering and control input into Isadora. So make sure you've got the patch that we had already worked on in the previous tutorial. Uh, we were using the note on watcher here to control the counter moving forward and backward through some clips. But now we want to be able to do some manipulations that are continuous controllers, and these are related to the round knobs that I showed you on the keyboard at the beginning of the other tutorial. Again, we need to figure out maybe what kind of message um, these produce. If you're familiar with MIDI, you might know already, but you can still always find out by clicking on the status window, and I'm going to take that knob and I'm going to turn it. And look here at the last message. It says, CTLCHG, this is a short abbreviation for control change, and it's telling me that it's num101, that's the identifier of the knob, and then the value is, you can see, smoothly changing between 0 and 127. So the key here is that it's a control change message. So in the MIDI group, if I find the control watcher, bring that in, now I'm going to turn my knob and take a look at the value here. Again, you'll see controller 101, and you see the value ranging between 0 and 127. So again, like the note on watcher, these values on the left control which of the controllers you're going to see. Right now it's set to see any possible controller that's coming into the system. I'll turn some of the other knobs, you'll see that's controller 100, the next knob is controller 105, next knob is controller 104, etc. So we want to limit this again. So we're seeing the one knob we would like to, which is the first one I have here. And we can see that's controller 101. So like we did with the MIDI note on watcher, I'm going to set the controller input to 101. Now, when I turn that knob, we see it. And I turn the other knobs, and nothing happens because they don't have a controller number of 101. They don't match. So now I've got this knob, which I can turn up and down, and I'm going to connect that to the intensity input of the projector. So now, as I turn the knob from left to right, I can fade the image up and down. It's also a good reminder here. You'll notice that the value is going between 0 and 127. That's the standard way that all MIDI values work. They always go from 0 to 127. But the intensity goes from 0 to 100, so why is that happening? because of Isadora's automatic scaling. Remember, it knows that if I click on the word value here at the output, it's automatically set to go between 0 and 127 because that's how all MIDI values go. But the intensity, when I click on that word on the projector, goes from 0 to 100. So Isadora automatically takes that 0 to 127 and scales it to match the 0 to 100 range of the input of the projector. So we've got this great brightness control Let's do a couple other things with a few more controllers. I'm going to take another control watcher I just copied and pasted there, set it to 100 actually, which is the second knob. And so now this controller, control watcher will only see the first knob. This one will only see the second one. That's because I set the controller number to 100. I'm going to take that value into the left input of the projector. I'll copy and paste one more time, and now I need to find out what the third knob is. I've forgotten. So I go to the status window, I turn it, so I see that its controller number is 105. So I go to this third control watcher, set the controller number to 105, and I take the value into the top input. So first knob, brightness. Second knob, left and right position of the image. Third knob, up and down position of the image. So we actually have this way of like moving the image around based on those knobs. But of course, any numeric parameter inside of Isadora could be controlled like this. So let's add just one more. I go to the fourth knob, again back here in the status window, watching the last message input. That has a number of 104. Okay, going back to the patch, I make one more control watcher by copying and pasting, set the controller number to 104, and then take that value into the zoom input of the projector. So now that controller controls the size of the image, and again the other two allow me to move it around. 
So that's just one way in which you can use those continuous controllers, but there's any number of ways that you could put them into use in terms of these kinds of uh, effects and things. So for instance, let's make a little room here and I will go over and get the module called Motion Blur. I'm going to disconnect the wire between the movie player and projector. In fact, I'm going to widen this out now so we can see a bit more. Okay, and let's use our key at the bottom here. Okay, there's a good one maybe. Let's use our knob to zoom that in. Let's see, maybe we can find an even better. That's pretty good. We can really see the blur in that one when it's moving around, yeah? Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to change some of the properties of motion blur. I've got a cum amount and decay amount. So I'm going to get two more control watchers. And we're going to look at the next two knobs on the keyboard. That's number controller number 102, controller number 103. So I go back to those control watchers, set the controller number to 102 and 103, and then I take the value output, one of them into the acume amount, and the second control watcher that I just made, the value will go into the decay amount. Now I can play with those parameters on the effect, just like I've been playing with everything else. So here, if I turn the decay amount up very high, you'll see that the blur really goes away. But if I turn the decay amount to zero, it almost becomes a white, white out situation, right? So maybe having the decay amount so high, or so low, I should say, isn't so useful. But I can also turn the acume amount up higher. And you can see that what's nice about this, you can just kind of play around with some different settings to see how it actually makes the image look, because they're all going to behave in very different ways. Yeah. So now I've got an interactive little video instrument. Using the knobs on the keyboard and the keys here, I can pick a clip and I can also move it around. I can zoom it. Okay, that's a nice one to look at. And I can change those parameters on the motion blur. Nice one. So basically that's all there is to it and these are the two most in, uh, important controllers that you're going to work with with MIDI is the note on and the control watcher. Most of the devices you're going to hook up to are going to use these as inputs. There are many many kinds of MIDI devices out there that you can use and I think that the key uh, suggestion that I think is the most important one is to be able to use that status window here if you go to the windows menu and say uh, show status to use that last message input to figure out what kind of a message you're getting. You can anytime you move like here's another one if I go pitch bend that's a different kind of controller and you can see it shows me the name of that message then I would use the pitch bend watcher to see it. That can be really helpful if you don't really know exactly what kind of uh, message your device is producing and maybe what specific ID or controller it is. So there's a whole lot deeper that you can go into this, but this is the key information that you need to be able to specifically pick out a note or a controller and use that to control any parameter in Isadora. As you can see, if you can expand on this with complicated MIDI controllers with lots of information coming from them, you really can have this fantastic tactile interface into the patch that you're making.